All right, in this video I'm going to talk about work, power, and energy and how they are all related. So if you are to do work on an object, then you have transferred energy to that object. And the law of conservation of energy states that energy can be neither created nor destroyed. It can only change forms. So essentially, the energy is going from the worker to the object. And therefore, work is actually equivalent to the change in energy of the object, or equivalent to energy. Um, and we call this the work energy theorem. So energy or mechanical energy is expended in the form of work. And when work is accomplished, it's accomplished by applying a force, which and then in turn causes an object to move. Now, when you apply more force to an object, there's a greater total distance uh, achieved and therefore um, more work is done. So work is related to force and distance but only the force that is a parallel is parallel to the direction of the actual motion. So we say that work is equal to force parallel to the displacement of the object. Now remember this looks very similar to torque but remember that was force perpendicular to the uh, distance to the fo from the fulcrum. Okay, so that's why torque and um, work have different units. Now, if you're given a force at an angle, if you take the cosine of that angle, it will give you the component of the force that is um, parallel to the displacement of the object. So just keep that in mind that if um, you have an angled vector, then you will have to use trigonometry in order to find only the force that contributes to the work, which is parallel to the displacement. The unit for work is a joule. It's actually a derived unit. It's newtons times meters, but it's different than torque, which is why we've given it a different name. Um, and it's written with the letter J. Now, because we know work and energy are equivalent to one another, joules is also the unit for energy. Power is defined as the rate at which work is done or energy is transferred to an object. Um, and this, again, is also a derived unit. Whenever you see the rate of something being done, it's that over time. So this would be work or energy over time. So that would be joules over seconds, which is also known as watts, written with the letter, capital letter W. So here um, we can see we have power equals work over time, or this could say energy over time. And we just learned that work was force times distance, so you could also have force times distance over time. Um, but we already know that distance over time is velocity, so you could also see it as force times velocity. So there's all these different ways in which we can calculate power or the rate at which work is done on an object. Now we're going to be talking about energy and conservation of energy all the way until the end of the year in every unit, but we're going to start by applying it to this idea of mechanical energies. So three types we're going to talk about, there is kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and elastic potential energy. Now kinetic energy is the energy that an object has because of its motion. So when work is done on an object, it moves, it's going to change its velocity because it has gained energy from the amount of work that's going to be has been done and so that's called the kinetic energy so work is equivalent to the change in the kinetic energy of the object which is relative to both its mass and its velocity so we write it as one half the mass most often in these instances the mass is staying the same it's not changing as the object moves but what is changing is the velocity so you have v final squared minus v initial squared now we can also calculate the kinetic energy at any instant in time so if we wanted to figure out the instantaneous kinetic energy of an object we then just take one half times the mass times the velocity squared all right, so the next type is the gravitational potential energy. So work must be done in order to lift an object up off of the ground. And when this work is done, the energy is said to be stored in the object. So that's why we call it potential energy. That's also called stored energy. Now, the higher you lift it up off the ground, the more energy you have given to it, and therefore uh, the more work that you have done. So the instantaneous gravitational potential energy is relative to the mass, the gravity, and the height that you have lifted it above the ground.
Now if we wanted to calculate the work that was done in order to lift this up, we could calculate the change in gravitational potential energy, and then we would use the change in the heights from one relative position to the other to see how much energy was then added or changed um, by doing work on the object. Okay, and then the last kind is called elastic potential energy. So elastic potential energy is done um, using elastic materials. So some different types of elastic materials, we can think of a pole vault, we can look at, think of springs or slinkies um, or rubber balls or trampolines, all sorts of things, anything that has an elastic property. And the amount of energy that you can store in something that's elastic is dependent on the stiffness or the elasticity of the object. So we typically think about it in terms of springs. So each object's elasticity is given by a constant K. It's also known as the spring constant, which defines the stiffness of the spring. Now, Hooke's law actually defines this constant value, and we'll talk more about this in the next unit, but it essentially says that the force applied is equivalent to the spring constant times the displacement. And there's a minus here because the force is going to be applied in the opposite direction as the object is then um, displaced. So just to give you an idea of what this means, if I were to take this spring here and I were to pull on it or apply a force to it, it's going to get longer, right? So its x is going to change or the relative position of the end of the spring is going to change. The stiffer the spring is, the more force it's going to require to change its um, length and therefore the um, more energy is going to be put into it. That also is true if we were to try and smush it and make it smaller. So K is the stiffness of the spring. The more stiff the spring is, the more force it takes to move the, ob the spring and therefore the more energy can be stored. If it's something like a slinky and it doesn't take a lot of energy, then it's going to have a very small spring constant. So in order to figure out the stored energy of the object, we say that elastic potential energy is equal to one half Kx squared. So K being the spring constant of the spring, and for now you pretty much be told what that value is, and x being the change in the length of the spring or the position of the, the uh, springy or elastic object. So in this unit we're talking about mechanical energies. So the idea of the conservation of mechanical energy, we have to make some assumptions that aren't necessarily true to to start with here. So we know that conservation means that energy is neither created nor destroyed. It can only change forms. And for our purposes, we're going to assume that we're dealing with an isolated system within that only mechanical energies are going to be present. So we're not going to deal with the loss of heat or sound or light. We're just going to say it's a sort of a perfect or ideal system. So energy is only going to be transferred from one form of mechanical energy to another. So our conservation of energy equation in general is that any energy you have at the beginning, whether it be potential or kinetic, is going to be equivalent to the potential or the kinetic energy that you have after, um, um, at the end of the scenario. And I'll give you a bunch of different examples in class, and maybe I'll make a video um, demonstrating some of these. So just to kind of keep in mind, so this isn't the conservation of total energy. We're, for this unit, just creating that ideal system. But we know that there are other forms of energy um, that are involved. So if our system is um, open, then there can be uh, heat loss, you know, in the form of friction or in the form of sound or light. So there's lots of different uh, types of energies that could play a role um, that could cause a loss in mechanical energy. But again, for our purposes, we're going to idealize everything and say that all mechanical energy is perfectly conserved and we have an isolated system.